If you are a parent, a grandparent or a carer, how are you feeling about the kids going back to school? And if you're a teacher, what are your thoughts? Send me a message, 0438 922 936, or you can give me a call on 1300 222 936. The Tasmanian branch of the Australian Education Union is calling on the state government to revisit its back-to-schools plan, saying it's actually underdeveloped. David Genford is the president. David, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Carly. And if I could just uh, quickly point out, it's not just teachers. All of our uh, teacher assistants and support staff as well have, have similar concerns, especially when they're working uh, so closely with students um, in the coming weeks. Yeah, very good point that you uh, raised there. So tell us why, in your opinion, is the plan underdeveloped? I think it definitely needs to be improved. I think um, the three, probably three key areas that our focus has been on has been um, ventilation, uh, masks, and also the um, when a and when a staff member becomes a close contact. Um, when it comes to ventilation, we're really keen for some evidence to show that the measures that have been taken are actually producing the safe air that's required in classrooms. Um, we're seeing in the TAS TAFE sector that they're doing a a genuine audit. They've contracted some people out to actually do some of these measurements. We're very keen for the DOE to do the same thing in, in our schools because we think from a from a parent perspective, a staff perspective, a, a, a child's perspective, they want to know that um, what uh, actions have been put in place are, are actually going to work. Now, you say there's growing teacher unrest ahead of the 2022 school year. What are you hearing? Uh, I'm just hearing that we haven't... Um, had a lot of our concerns answered. Um, we've got a pretty key meeting with the department this afternoon. Uh, on Tuesday, um, we were able to meet with the acting minister, um, Mr. Rockliffe, um, and really put forward why we've got our concerns. And hopefully, over the, the last couple of days, um, we've and and say we'll be able to see some some movement. Um, we were really pleased that the plan got announced so early. Um, but the reason why we wanted that is so that we can really fine tune it and improve it, and that's. That's what we want to do today, and we're hoping that we can see some movement from the department in some of those key areas. And is one of the things you're likely to propose at today's meeting a a pushing back of the school year for it to be delayed or not? Uh, not at this stage. Um, I think from a government school perspective, we've still got two weeks. Um, we do have some staff. Our college staff will return uh, next week, I think it is. Um, and we want to make sure that we're not uh, requiring staff to have uh, mass meetings or, or mass PO when we can, when we know we can do it from a technological perspective in a um, in a, a Zoom experience or a Microsoft Teams experience. But um, from a from a student perspective, we've got two weeks to get this right. Um, let's make sure we're putting the plans in place. Uh, let's demonstrate how how we're providing safe environments for students so we can provide that assurance for. Um, parents who are making that decision about what's going to happen on February 9th. Do you know, speaking of uh, getting the work done, if any uh, anything started in the way of improving the ventilation in classrooms, ha- have the filtrate, you know, air filters and things gone in? Have windows been, you know, fixed? That sort of stuff. Uh, we're definitely hoping to get an update in regards to the windows. So there was identified there was 8,018 windows that needed to be fixed so that they could open. Um, so they don't need to be replaced. It might just be that they need to be um, some slight alterations so they can they can open. Um, we'd love to know where that is up to. Um, also, in regards to air purifiers, I believe that most of them have been delivered to schools. Some schools feed back to us that they feel as though that they, they need more, but um, there needs to be a clear um, guidelines as to how to use these correctly and what classrooms they need to be in. Um, so it's important that those guidelines are developed and, and the and the department acknowledged that and they are putting forward those guidelines. But I think um, to ease some of the school's concerns is if we can get those guidelines out as soon as possible, we'll help them uh, understand what needs to be done. On a totally separate level, nothing to do with COVID, does it not surprise you that 8,000 plus windows actually need repairing so that kids and classrooms can just get fresh air and, of course, teachers? Uh, having been a teacher for the past I mean, it's 19 years, it, it doesn't surprise me. I've been in lots of classrooms where... It uh, simply hasn't been the case. Um, I think that we have a lot of uh, infrastructure that needs improving in schools. Um, and th- this is what happens when we feel as though schools are underfunded, um, that the, the uh, infrastructure, the learning spaces don't become the priority. Um, when new, new buildings are created or new money is being spent, 
then there, there can be a focus on the facilities. But uh, a lot of our schools are, are becoming run down or already run down, um, and we'd love to see um, some money put forward. And it was great to see a, a pledge by the, the Federal Labor Party that some of that money will be put forward, including... Um, fully funding our, our schools to, to help our students reach their potential. Now, an issue that's been raised before, of course, is the lack of teachers and also relief teachers. How many of the older teachers um, that have been, uh, you know, proposing to return to work are saying they now won't go back? Uh, well, I haven't had many banging my door down, letting me know that, um, that they'll be there. Um, and, and this is why we want to see extra safety measures taken. So, if we can't provide that safe learning environment, our relief teachers, especially those from the from the older cohort who who have great experience um, from a relief teaching perspective, um, if they don't feel safe, they're not going to come along. So we that's part of our push with the government is to say you're getting some advice. Let's do better than the bare minimum so we can actually provide those safe safe learning spaces not only for the staff, we want to see the students as well, especially our primary students who haven't had the chance to be fully vaccinated, um, to to be in a safe learning environment and to give that assuredness to the to all of the community. Now, do you envisage as school goes back that a lot of classes are likely to be folded or as it's a term, obviously, if anyone doesn't know it, for joining together classes due to lack of staff? Because we saw this happening already last year. It's definitely happening, and, and then one of my concerns is that that um, reduces the ability to socially distance in classrooms if you've got those increased numbers. Um, so I'm, it's, it is one of my concerns is that you are going to create um, learning spaces that have a higher density of students than required. Um, so, yeah, what, what will the plan be in regards to collapsing classes? Um, I know the department is talking about getting some of our... Um, staff that aren't in schools that have previously been teachers or are working in some of those high level jobs to come back to schools and help um, but I don't know how far that will be able to stretch so um, we hope that the the, um, the amount of backup relief staff etc will be there but I just don't think it will be because we've seen in previous years where we haven't had to deal with um, COVID and especially the Omicron variant um, that so many of our schools can't staff. I'd, I'd, we did a bit of a tour of the, the East Coast and North East Coast and the, the principals and um, people in charge of relief would laugh at you and I would say, so what's relief like at the school? And they, they look at you like you're, you're crazy because they assume, you're assuming they can get some, but they, just, they simply can't. So they're simply not available even if they want them? Absolutely. Um, there's some major issues in our regional schools. Um, I had the same thing three years ago when I travelled on the West Coast and um, it wouldn't surprise me next year when I, or this year when we head up to the circular head, we'll hear the same thing. The, the regional schools can't find relief staff and there's, we need some type of um, incentives or a really thorough review as to why this is happening. And with the government putting out the invitation to get retired teachers to return, are they providing you with those figures? Because obviously the Teacher Registration Board doesn't have that much time to process them ahead of the school year starting. So are you getting those numbers? Who's accepting how many new registrations or, or retired teachers are re-registering? It's definitely a question we'll be asking this afternoon um, because I've seen a, a bit of a social media push by the department to ask for those retired teachers to step forward. But you make a great point in regards to the Teachers Registration Board. Is there extra funding? Is there extra staff being provided to, to get through all those registrations? Because we know um, from previous reports we need to make sure we've got qualified teachers, um, people of good character in front of the classes and not just anyone who puts their hand up and that's why the registration process is there, but if it can't be done in time, you're still going to fall short at the start of the year, which we don't want to see happen. And roughly how long does that process take? Uh, because I know a retired teacher who uh, put their name back on the books um, to do temp teaching or relief teaching. It took a little bit of time to sort all that paperwork out. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's hard to give a number now because if there are so many extra, I would assume that it's going to be an even longer process. So um, sometimes it can be a two to two to four week process. Sometimes you get lucky and it's quiet and it gets done in a week. So if we have 400 teachers, which, which I don't think is going to happen, but that's what the number the Premier quoted, um, all happen at the same time, I would assume it's going to be a, a very long wait. But um, I don't think we'll have that number of retired teachers putting their hand up. I think they're, uh, they've uh, earned their retirement and, and they'll be enjoying themselves um, and unless they 
feel as though it can be safe and it's something that they want to do. My guest on the program is David Genford, the Tasmanian President of the Australian Education Union. Uh, David, uh, Helena in Rosny has joined the conversation and she's texted in saying, good morning, I'm worried that the plans regarding ventilation are not going to be individualised enough. She says our public schools are all so different. And uh, so she goes on to, you know, wonder if they're also noisy and that sort of thing. Generally, the ones I'm familiar with are not noisy, but uh, she is concerned about individual tailored plans for ventilation. Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why we've called for schools to be able to access carbon dioxide monitors so that they can do some spot checks and do some ongoing auditing of the ventilation in schools. Um, I don't think we need to do this as a one-off. I think we're going <clears> to <throat> excuse me, have concerns if this continues into winter and the only, op- the only solution is to open windows, then it's going to be freezing for students to, to learn. So um, what's, what is the plan going forward? So we have those same concerns that, the, like, similar to what I said before, the older schools um, are going to find it really difficult. Some of the newer schools, they've been more thought of. You've got air conditioning in place. Um, the ventilation's probably a bit better. But if schools can have that access to some type of monitoring device, we've suggested a, a CO2 monitor from the research we've read, um, and I think that would give um, staff and also uh, parents a little bit more assuredness as to... Um, what is the safe air levels in their learning spaces. And just finally, do schools have enough masks? Do you think we've got a message here from a concerned teacher who says Catholic school teachers and students are being asked to buy their own masks? No talk about air purifiers in the classroom for Catholic schools. She says very vague vague framework from Catholic education. Yeah, so I I can't really comment on what the Catholic sector and independent sector are doing. That's um, the independent union works with those, but... What I can say from a government perspective, they did order 1.6 million surgical masks, which have been delivered to schools. Um, in regards to surgical masks, we feel as though there needs to be a supply of, of two masks a day because the, um, the instructions say you need to change it every four hours, which would need to see people happen. But what we're also finding, the data coming out of the US shows that the uh, P2 N95 masks or KN95 masks as well offer greater protection and longer protection Um, And we really would like to see our staff um, wearing those so that um, we don't want to see them getting sick and and causing the collapse classes. Um, Those surgical masks will be available for children and staff is the current plan. Um, And we'd like to see that improvement to staff masks. But um, I think that the the ordering of masks we're comfortable with from a a government perspective, um, it'll be interesting. Obviously, they need to be replenished and how easy that will be. But... Um, they did order the, the 1.6 million, which I think was a, a good start. Um, just that quality we want for a, the, from a staff perspective. Okay, one very last issue I did say finally before, but uh, a teacher <laughs> no has texted in. Um, I'm concerned about staff rooms, this teacher says, often very full, lots of juggling past each other in the rush for coffee and tea before going out on duty. Is that going to be a bit of an issue, working out you know, social distancing in staff rooms? Uh, absolutely. Um, another question we've put forward, but um, I think the reply seems to be that from an adult perspective, there's a, a greater ability to socially distance and to make sure you're wearing your mask correctly, etc. Um, but like the like the teacher has, has pointed out, all, all staff are there's a, a short short breaks, especially that recess break, and they're trying to maybe grab a cup of coffee or a, a bottle of water or whatever it might be. So. Um, I think uh, we've found in, in all sectors of the community that um, some adults are taking these instructions more seriously than others um, and we would just urge people to really maintain that, that social distancing and, and mask wearing to enable um, their own safety going forward. Well, look, appreciate your time, David Genford. I think we will touch base again following this afternoon's meeting just to find out whether you got the information you need. We can ask you more questions about uh, uh, rats being delivered to the schools and, and just catch up on a bit more of the information following your meeting with the government this afternoon. No worries. Thanks, Carly. Thanks for your time. David Genford there.